If you have your Bibles this morning, uh, we're going to start, actually turn to Hebrews chapter 10. I want to read that passage first, and then we'll go to our, our text for this morning, which will be in 1 Peter. But I want to read Hebrews chapter 10. We've been in this, I think, a couple of Sundays now, this same passage, and I want to give you this morning the other side from last Sunday's message. So... Uh, if you just remember what we talked about last Sunday, but this is going to be the other side of it. And in Hebrews chapter 10, and begin reading in verse 19 again, he says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, he has inaugurated for us a new and a living way through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled. Did I turn this on? Nope. It's on now. With our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. So that's kind of what we've been talking about. We've been talking about coming to church and why we should be in church and kind of what the purpose of church is. If you remember, I, I kind of started this uh, three Sundays ago. I think it was on Father's Day Sunday with five reasons why I'd rather go fishing this morning and why I didn't. And then we talked last week about the church being gathered together and why we should do that and what we're going to face in the future. Well, again, today I want to talk about a little bit the other side and some other things that he says. Now, James chapter 1 and verse 2 says this, Consider it great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials. And that's one of those verses that, that most of us maybe even wish, you know, I wish that wasn't even in the Bible. Because that's extremely difficult. And even just the concept of when you are struggling, when you're, you're sick, when you're going through very, very difficult times, just the, the very concept of considering it great joy. I believe the King James maybe says consider it pure joy. And sometimes... That's just a difficult, difficult concept to grasp. And it's very hard for us to do. But nevertheless, that's what Scripture tells us to do. And I want to give you this morning from our text in 1 Peter chapter 4, if you want to turn over there, I want to give you a couple of things this morning from our text that will help us and will help us see that in the days that are before us, these things will strengthen us and help us to stand together in the last days. So 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 12, we read this last week also. He said, Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you as if something unusual were happening. Instead, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ so that you may also rejoice with great joy when his glory is revealed. If you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God in having that name. For the time has come for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who disobey the gospel? And if a righteous person is saved with difficulty, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while doing what is good. Now, before we get into our text, I want you to notice two other things in this chapter, but make it very important. First of all, 
verse 1, chapter 4 and verse 1. Notice what he says. This is the beginning of what he's talking about. He says, therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same understanding. Because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin. So he's telling us to look at Jesus. And to see and understand what he went through and why he went through it. And you remember that Jesus told the disciples, he said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And we saw this in Acts as the new church started out. And then look at verse 7. And just that, that really that first phrase, but the whole thing. He says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded for prayer. Verse 8, and above all, maintain constant love for one another since love covers a multitude of sins. So he tells us to look to the sufferings of Christ because he says there's going to come a time when you're going to endure the exact same things. And then he tells us, look, it's the end times. Now, they thought they were in the last days. That's why a lot of people have so much trouble with us thinking we're in the last days today because they say, well, they've been thinking that since Acts chapter 2. And that's true because Peter stood up and he announced this is exactly what Joel prophesied. This is the last days just like he said it was and you see the signs. Now, I don't have time this morning to go into all of that, but we're in the last days, folks. Amen. They thought they were. We know we are. They didn't have the complete revelation that we have. All they had was the Old Testament. We have the New Testament also. And we know and understand where we are. So when we come to this passage, in beginning in verse 12, the, the setting for us is the sufferings of Christ and the last days. And so when he begins, there are certain parts of this passage, in particular what we looked at last week, that almost always gets preached on or gets taught on but there are two things in particular in this passage that don't get looked at much and that's what I want to talk about this morning and that's what I want to encourage you with because yes he says persecution is coming yes he says we are going to suffer for the name of Christ yes he says judgment is going to begin at the house of God so where does that leave us as children of God. Well, notice what he says, first of all, in verse 14. He says, if you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Now, why are you blessed? He says, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. So, first of all, just first thought off the top of my head, take it from this. When you're persecuted... When somebody comes after you for being a Christian, it's not you they're coming after. It's that glory of God that rests upon you. It's that image of God, that presence of the Holy Spirit that is in you that they're coming after. And then the second thing that he says in verse 19, and this ought to give us great courage. He says, so then let us suffer according to God's will. Encouraging. Listen to what he says. Then let us suffer according to God's will and entrust themselves to a faithful creator while doing what is good. So whose will is it that we suffer like we're going to in the last times? Whose will is it that we be persecuted? That we be, in the last days, hunted down and killed for the name of Christ? Whose will is it? It's God's will. You say, come on, preacher. You mean it's God's will for me to suffer the things that I'm going to suffer? You mean it was God's will for those first Christians in the book of Acts to be killed, to be fed to lions, to be crucified like they were? Yes, that's what I mean. And I mean it in this sense. It's God's will because God prophesied. He spoke it through the Old Testament prophets. He said, this is exactly what's going to happen. They're going to hate me. They're going to hate those that follow me. And when we come down to the end time and evil rises like it's going to, they're going to even kill us. Amen. 
So what do we do? Where does that leave us? Well, I want you to remember what he said. Number one, the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. If you're a born-again child of God, especially if you're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and living each and every day of your life submitted to the will of God, he says that the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Now, when we talk about God's glory, in particular in a biblical manner, normally we think about it as a great light. All the way through scripture, we see examples, we see pictures, we see descriptions. Think about Isaiah in chapter 6. Think about Ezekiel in chapter 1. Think about John in the book of Revelation in chapter 1 and chapter 4. And the thing that they all have in common is the great light. And I saw a great light. Well, it's pretty obvious that that doesn't happen to us. Even the most spiritual, the greatest super Christian to ever walk the face of the earth, maybe the Apostle Paul. There's no record anywhere of people having to put on sunglasses when they met the Apostle Paul because the light didn't shine out of him. One example is, for example, in Acts chapter 22, verse 6 through 11, Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. You'll recall that he said he was riding along and a great light shone out of heaven. He fell off his horse had a conversation with Christ, was converted. And then in verse 11, he says, since I couldn't see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and went into Damascus. In the Old Testament, the same thing. A particular story, Exodus chapter 33, Moses. Moses said to the Lord, please, let me see your glory. Now remember, this is a man that God said, and I've talked face to face. Me and Moses are friends. We, we talk. But Moses had never seen his glory. He had seen his representation. He had seen the Shekinah glory over the mercy seat. He had seen the, the thunder, the clouds up over the mountain. But he had never seen the full glory of God. And God said, Moses, you can't do that. Matter of fact, in this very passage, he says that if you look upon my face, humans cannot see me and live. And so what did he do? He said, look, I'm going to put you over here by the rock. When I come by, I'm going to put you up in a crevice. I'll put my hand over you. And after I go by, you can see my hind parts, but you can't see my face. And, and that's what he did. So rather than when you read this passage, rather than thinking about the light of the glory of God shining through us, which, no, think about the power of God. The power of God. Because all of these passages that you read about the glory, that light basically manifests the power of God. How powerful is that light? Revelation says in chapter 22, 21 and 22, that when we get into eternity, there'll be no need for the sun or the moon because the glory of God will illuminate all of creation. And everybody will walk by that light. That's, that's pretty powerful. So think about it in your life as the power of God being on you and manifested in you. So God's glory on us could also be thought of as his power in a couple of ways. Number one, the power to stand in the face of persecution. Now, we read some stuff this morning in Sunday school about a particular era in Israel's history and some battles that they won against tremendously overwhelming odds. You and I would be standing on a hill and seeing this battle about to take place down there and we would just shake our head and say, man, the Israelites are about to get slaughtered. We're talking about a professional football team playing a, a, a Nacogdoches Little League football team. And Israel won. And they won because of God's power in them and on them. And you see this repeated over and over and over. And it's the power of God that empowers us and enables us to do things, especially in the last days when we're faced with these things that we never thought we could do. For example, the disciples were able to stand before the Sanhedrin court knowing that the Sanhedrin had the power to put them to death. 
but they were able to stand before them and they could say things like, it's better for us to serve God than to serve you. But wait a minute. I can have you put to death. I can have you imprisoned and take everything you've got. It's better for us to serve God than to serve you. And remember, when they left the presence of the Sanhedrin, the scripture always, in every instance, recorded that they spoke the word more boldly after they left the Sanhedrin. So one way to think about the glory of God is to think about his power in you, enabling you to stand and to do things that you never thought. And then another way the power of God will be manifested in our lives is Jesus told the disciples that when they were persecuted, he said, don't worry about what to say because it will be given to you in that moment. Now, that's a great comfort to me. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. And I want you to see this in context, specifically, specifically. In Mark chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, they're leaving the temple. The disciples are saying, man, look at the beauty of all this. Beginning in verse 3, he tells me, he says, all these things that you see, they're going to be torn down. And then through verse 3 to verse 8 is the passage we know of from Matthew chapter 24, verse 4 through 8. Wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, false Christ, persecution, and all those things. And at the end of verse 8, he said, these are the beginning of birth pains. So they're not in the tribulation yet. These are all the things that are leading up to it and getting ready. And then watch what he says in verse 9. He says, but be on your guard. They will hand you over to local courts and you will be flogged in the synagogues and you will stand before governors and kings because of me as a witness to them as it is necessary that the gospel be preached to all nations. Verse 11. So when they arrest you and hand you over, don't worry beforehand what you will say. But say whatever is given to you at that time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. So Jesus' word to them, and by extension to us, because we are the ones that are going to face this, this last day, and if not us, then surely the generation after us, his word to us is, look, when they persecute you, when they come against you and arrest you and, and you're standing there just like the disciples standing before the Sanhedrin and they're telling you, you either recant Jesus Christ or, or go to jail or worse yet, pay with your life. Jesus says, don't worry about it. Don't be sitting there trying to think up some great flowery speech. Don't try to be some great theologian. He says, I'll give you what you need to say. The Holy Spirit in you will come upon you. And what did he tell us back there? He said in, in 1 Peter 4, he said, look, he said, the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And this is one of the ways that it does. His power will come upon you. And he says, I will give you what you need to say in that moment. How many times have you been in a situation that you were needing to witness or, or needing to stand up for the truth of God or, or something like that and just all of a sudden you just started talking you just started saying things and, and later on looking back you said I, I didn't know that <laughs> you know, where did that come from folks that's what he's talking about He's saying that my power will come upon you and when you get in these situations and when you're standing there facing persecution, facing the loss of life, facing all of the things that scripture decides, he says, don't worry about it because the glory of God and the spirit rest upon you. And he says, I will give you what you need to say. 
Back to the disciples in the book of Acts. Remember in chapter 4, they had been brought before the Sanhedrin again. And the Sanhedrin were threatening them and, and all of these things again. And, and they said, look, we're going to serve God, not you. We, we, all we can do is preach and teach what we saw. The Sanhedrin put them outside for a minute so they could confer. And here's what they said. When they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus Christ. Why? Because the spirit of power and the glory of God was upon them. Remember Stephen. In his dying moments, the scripture records that they couldn't refute a word he said. That is what I'm talking about. That's the power of God. We can't be Samson's, in particular in the last days, and fulfill the will and the purpose of God. We can't all be Moses and part the Red Sea because that would not fulfill the purposes of God in the last days. But we can all be for lack of better ways, Apostle Paul's and Apostle Peter's, and stand up under the power of the Holy Spirit in the face of the greatest persecution, even down to our lives, and speak the gospel of Jesus Christ. I shared with you here a while back some stories out of a book called Fox's Book of Martyrs, and, and I suggest you get it and read it sometime, because there are some stories in there of people that are tied to the stake and the fire is licking at their robes, at their feet, and they are singing praises to God, just like Peter and Silas in jail. That's the power of God when it comes upon people. That's a child of God when he walks in the spirit and the glory of God. Those things are what Jesus promises us. And then the second thing from this passage that we don't talk about very much, and it is a little bit difficult to understand, as I alluded to just a while ago, the second thing is, is that in this time and in the last days, the suffering will be according to God's will. The greatest thing we can do to comfort our soul. The greatest thing that we can do to encourage each other is to remind each other that what's happening is happening according to God's will. And the best way to understand that is not what I butchered just a while ago. It's like this. We have God's will. God's will is his word and his word is his will. And he has already told us what his will is. Now the world looks at what's going to happen. Even Daniel did. Some of the times you read that Daniel saw some of the visions that he saw. And some of the things that are going to happen to the Jewish people throughout the years. And the scripture will record that I, Daniel, was sick. I was down on my face. I couldn't get up. I felt so bad. I was so upset by what I saw was going to happen to my people and to my holy city. And to the world looking at it, like what I said just a while ago, sometimes it looks like we are fixing to go into a battle and there is no human way we can win. It's just not possible. But we don't look at things according to the world. We don't understand things according to the world. People look at the Middle East right now and they say, oh man, them Muslims and them Jews, look at that. That's just a, a terrible battle. I'm looking at that battle and I'm saying, oh man, look at that. God's word is coming to pass. If you watch my teaching Thursday night, you saw that other nations are now entering the fray that perfectly match Ezekiel chapter 38. Other nations that have nothing to do with what's going on over there. But they're lining up just according to God's word. And when you and I see persecution come against the church, when we see governments begin to pass laws against the church, 
and against Christianity and against the truths and the laws of God, we know and we understand what's going on. And so instead of getting all upset, instead of jumping up and, and deciding, let's run over here or let's go hide, we stand strong because we know what God's will is. We know what's going to happen. And because we know that we're going to suffer, because we know that persecution is going to come against us, we can face it with strength because we know God already knew it. And he's already prepared for it. Notice what he says in verse 22, back in our text. He says, I think, I'm, I'm, let me get back to Hebrews. Verse 22, Hebrews chapter 10, and verse 23. Let us hold to our confession of our hope without wavering. Why? Since he who promised is faithful. Every word of God is true. And we can draw near, as he says in the text, we can draw near to God with a heart full of assurance and faith because every word that God says is true and will come to pass. Amen. So what does that mean for you and me when we face persecution. That means, number one, I already knew this was going to happen. Peter said, look, he said, when these things begin to happen, you don't think it's something strange. You already know it's going to happen. Number two, I know God's going to meet all my needs. I know that God's power is going to be in me, and I'll be able to stand. Number three, even if they kill me, God's promise to me is, first of all, resurrection. Second of all, the moment that I die in this life, where do I wake up? Where do I go? Heaven. In the presence of the Lord. His word is true. And then, above all of that, I have his promise of the second coming. And when he comes back, he will make things right. Remember Revelation chapter 6, the souls under the altar. And they were saying, oh Lord, how long until you avenge our death? And the Lord didn't tell him, well, that may not happen. The Lord said, no, you wait to the appointed time. And when it's time, I will make things right. We have his promise. And we know that he is faithful to his promise. And one of the greatest things about us, our understanding of scripture, is his promises that we won't go through the tribulation period. We'll be raptured out of here before it happens. Folks, it's things like this is why people like Daniel could live in Babylon for probably close to 80 years, stand strong like he did, and all the way through the Babylon story, you see the spirit and the glory of God on Daniel. He always knew what to say whether it was interpreting dreams or, or just telling the king, look, king, here's what's going to happen. He always knew. And then God always manifested himself in Daniel and through Daniel through the dreams and the prophecies that he gave us. But then here's the thing that I want you to remember about Daniel as I tie this back into why should we come to church? Why should we stand together? Folks, Daniel did not do all of that by himself. Daniel didn't go to the lake on Sunday because he could worship God so much better over there by himself. Where did he go? Every time, every time Daniel got in the vine, where did he go? To his brothers and sisters, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had their little church. They met together. They encouraged each other. They were always there for one another, praying for one another, helping one another. And I think maybe sometimes in the New Testament, matter of fact, I know for a fact, because all they had was the Old Testament when they wrote the New Testament, 
that they were looking back at some of that stuff. And perhaps the writer in Hebrews was thinking about the fiery furnace. When he told us, he said, look, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the manner of some. But all the more, as you see the day approaching, come together and encourage each other and exhort each other to love and to good works. And he could see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing there on the, the front of that, that burning, fiery furnace and facing that king. And that king saying, boys, I'm going to kill you. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego together. Daniel, we don't know where he was at this moment, but I promise you he's praying. Saying, King, uh, maybe Peter got some of this. We don't need to answer you. King, before the God we serve, you're nothing. And our God will, and uh, our God will deliver us. It'll either be in the fire or through the fire, but either way, we'll be out of your hands. Where did that come from? From somebody standing in a corner by himself? From somebody that, no, folks, it came from God and from his people coming together, worshiping God, strengthening each other, encouraging each other to stand in the last days. One other thought that I had, you go through the Bible, and except for one or two prophets in the Old Testament, one or two, and if you really pay attention to what you're reading, you'll see that they wound up depressed and wanting to die. God's people or his person is never alone by themselves. They're always with somebody. The one example that I'm thinking about was Elijah. After the Mount Carmel incident, Jezebel said, oh, I'm going to kill him. Tell Elijah by this time tomorrow he'll be dead. And what did Elijah do? He ran off by himself, hid in a cave, got depressed, and began to whine and cry. Oh, Lord, you might as well just, just kill me. No other time are people alone. And I could start making a list right now of so and so, Joshua and Caleb, Jonathan and his armor bearer, move on up, David and Nathan, move on up, it just keeps going. Uh, Peter, James, and John, Paul and Silas, Barnabas and Timothy, I mean, they're never alone. Why? We need each other. That's God's design. I challenge you as we move into these last days and we see things that's going to happen more and more and more that you remember you are not Superman Christian. You are not Mr. Holy Spirit. You are a child of God. And it is God's will for these things to happen. And at the same time, it is God's will for us to come together Strengthen each other. Go out and face the world in the power of the Spirit and the glory of God on us. Amen? Amen. Let's stand.